Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Food, Wine, and Whiskey in Your Own Backyard. I am Rob, your host, and with me as always, Carter, how you doing? Doing great, man. Doing fantastic. It's a lovely little Saturday we have here. It is a lovely Saturday afternoon, and uh, we uh, have a guest today, David Jennings, a.k.a. uh, Rare Bird Bird. 101. How are you doing, David? Doing well, doing well. Well, we appreciate you coming on and, and letting us talk. We don't want to talk turkey today, just so you know. We don't want yeah, to talk anything. Not turkey, getting into it so. at all. <laughs> uh, no, we appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much for doing this. We're, we're looking forward to, to picking your brain. And, you know, we read a lot of your opinions on, on your blog and, and some other, you know, social network things that you put out. But being able to have a conversation with you is a treat for us, and we're really looking forward to it. So thank you very much for coming on. Hey, thanks for the invite. Okay, you're, you're kicking off a new segment for us, uh, and I, I hope we don't catch you off guard. Well, I know we're going to catch you off guard, but uh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> with our guests that we're going to have on the show from now on, we're trying to come up with a way to kind of pull the veil back a little bit and, and learn a little bit more about them. Um, so we've come up with five questions that we're going to start asking our guests to kick off the show, and, and you're the inaugural. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> first question, question number one is uh, your favorite 80s movie. Oh, boy. Um, There's so many good ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I was an 80s kid, so I grew up. Okay, this is going to be crazy, but uh, in terms of number of times watched, and if it's on, I'll leave it there. Uh, it's got to be Red Dawn. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, cool, a Red cool Dawn. movie <laughs> for sure. Love Red Dawn. Yeah, great cast, and uh, you know the yeah, remake good writing too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, question number two: favorite childhood food or meal? You know, did not necessarily. It might be from mom, might be from grandma, might be a restaurant you used to love to go to on a Friday night. But uh, what was that food or meal? Uh, hard to go wrong with good spaghetti. Oh. Nice. Just don't give me the, 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 the turkey spaghetti or any of that kind of weird stuff. You know, it's uh, just just meat sauce and noodles, and I'm good to go. Okay. Uh, question number three. Best decade for music, 70s, 80s, or 90s? And do you have a favorite genre within that decade? Wow. That's tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They get harder yeah. as we go. Okay. So... Best decade for music in general. Well, I, of course, every decade has its shining stars, and it's hard to kind of, you know, say, well, this is the best decade, okay? Yeah. But because I, I really want to say 70s for so many reasons, and I really want to say, like, for 70s, you know, you've got Led Zeppelin and Queen and Pink Floyd and, you know, Sabbath, and it's <clears throat> you really want to kind of go that way. But then, you know, in the 80s, you've got ACDC and Metallica. Kiss. And, and Kiss. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just so many good things. And, it, yeah, and a lot of them cross the 70s and 80s border, sure. too. Um, so it's really hard to say. But, you know, I was a teenager in the 90s. And, uh, you know, when Pearl Jam 10 came out oh, yeah. and Smash Your Me, Siamese Dream, Nirvana, Nevermind, all these things. I mean, it totally changed because I was like a hair metal guy. Like, I loved Motley Crue and Skid Row and everything. And and I still do. I mean, I, I, admittedly, I, I still listen to Poison and, and uh, you know, pretty much the hair metal genre in the 80s I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm game for. But uh, I didn't like, quote, unquote, grunge, you know, at, uh, at first. But it didn't take me long to kind of get pulled <laughs> in. And then, you know, I was like, 110 percent you know and and you know i joined a band and i sang lead vocals and we wrote songs and did you how really to play guitar yeah oh yeah man i was into it that oh, is wow. cool that's super cool well, i'm a musician myself so that's oh, cool. uh that's cool yeah and i, I yeah. did singing and guitar and all that kind of stuff so yeah I, I did it for years all the way till like my son was born and then you know it was kind of hard to do that kind of stuff yeah. um but uh, so the '90s kind of changed me uh, because you know I, I I found this new style of music that really kind of inspired me to write music and play music and everything. So anyway, I'm gonna say '90s. Although on another day in a different mood, I could say '80s or '70s. That's super uh, cool. So they all have a place in your heart. Definitely. All right. Cool. The next question is going to be pretty divisive, so I don't know if you're going to need okay. to think much about this one, but uh, chili 
beans or no beans? Beans. Uh, thank yes, you very yes. much. You're right. It's just meat <laughs> sauce if you don't have beans in it. God not, damn, thank you very chili. much. We're we, in Texas. We man. live in Texas, not but we're not Texas. from Texas. So, uh, you know, I grew up with beans in my chili, and, and that's just the way it was supposed to be. You come here, and it's like, yeah. no, that's not that's not chili. Uh, well, I mean, it's just stuff that goes on a hot dog then. <laughs> I've actually had, and people will be shocked by this. I mean, of course, I love a classic chili. But I've had uh, a couple vegetarian chilies because certain members of my 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 family um, are vegetarian, and um, I I've had some vegetarian chilies that are pretty kick ass to be honest with you, and so to me, you know, it's beef and beans, you know, onions, tomatoes, the whole deal, all that. that that's Absolutely. chili. Yeah. Yep. But uh, if it's just beef. You know, and there's no beans. It's beef. I mean, soup. we're looking at kind of like Tex-Mex spaghetti sauce, is what. Yeah, you know? exactly, exactly. I'm glad we're on the same yes. page there. I, I knew know, I okay, liked good. you. <laughs> now you know. Okay, so I'll make, I'll give it one exception. I can do hot dog chili without beans, but to me, that's a garnish. That's not a dish that you sit down with a bowl and eat. So. Completely agree. That's it. That's what I always tell people. I'm like. Yeah, if you want uh, uh, chili without beans, it goes great on a hot dog. Yep, yep. <laughs> That's a good answer. It's a garnish. Yeah. You can buy it in a can. <laughs> All right, the last question. Uh, for your final, your last nightcap pour. The final mm-hmm. nightcap. What would it be? Oh, like the, this is it? This, this is, is it. This is it. Damn. And you'll get a four-ounce pour, just so you know. You know, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I would be all that picky. Okay. I think if, like, the shit was going down, I would probably just, whatever was around <laughs> would be the first <laughs> thing i grab. I wouldn't sit there and get picky with it, like, oh, what is it going to be? You know, and then I'm like, I'm wasting my time. I need to hurry up and do something. So it's just like, here, give me that, you know. So yeah. probably whatever was closest in reach, which would more well, than likely be Russell's 10 or 101. Okay. And, and Carter and I were talking about this, uh, you know, with these questions for you when we were uh, before recording. And, uh, you know, my thought was, I go, I wonder which way he might go. And you went a totally different direction because I thought either he's going to say something that he's had and loved and is going to want to experience that again, or he's going to say something that maybe you've been chasing for such a long time. And if it's going to be available, you can pick anything. You're going to pick that. So yeah. <laughs> you actually went a direction I didn't expect. Well, so. okay. There's something to be said for comfort. Yeah. So, you know, People kind of overthink stuff. I mean, yeah, okay, you could go, well, I want, uh, you know, William LaRue Weller from 2004. (laughs) It's like, what? Okay, got it. But, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, a a half pour in, you're going to be like, this is good bourbon. Well, I could say that with, like, you know, a lot of other things. And why not go for something that you're very familiar with and drink on a regular basis and have comfort? There's something to be said for comfort. Absolutely. Uh, Oh, yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Well, as people are starting to listen to this, uh, David, can, tell everybody where they can find you. I and mean, I follow you on Twitter is kind of the main place I follow okay. you. Uh, obviously, I've seen you on some shows with uh, with the YouTube Whiskey Tubers and things like that. And I know you do some shows with uh, Kenny and those guys. Uh, oh, yeah. On I've done show. a few Bourbon Pursuit. Yeah. yeah. Great so, stuff. Uh, um, I'm, well, the main site to find me is at my blog, which is rarebird101.com. Uh, if you're interested in my Wild Turkey book, you can go to wildturkeybook.com. I'm on Instagram at rarebird101. I'm on Twitter at rbird101. I'm on Patreon, uh, which is patreon.com slash rarebird101. And uh, that's about it. Okay. Yeah. And, and your blog is fantastic. I mean, I you love have some, it. You have some great articles, but you also do reviews, which I think is really cool. Yep. Yeah, I'm actually working on people are going to laugh. I, I'm almost done. I, I, I had to go out of town this week, so I'm, I'm behind in publishing my blog post for the week. But it's almost done. I just kind of had to iron out some things. I should have it posted to Patreon today and then hopefully the blog tomorrow or Monday. Um, but I'm reviewing American Honey Sting. So this is this is going to be a first for me. Well, it's in my book briefly, but uh, this is the first time I've ever really kind of sat down with it and really tried to put it through its paces. And... Uh, you know, it, it doesn't suck. I'll say that. So do, do you have a general <laughs> feeling or a general thought on, you know, flavored whiskeys like that? Okay. Well, they serve a purpose. Okay. Uh, they're not something that I would recommend to an enthusiast. It's not something that you're going to want to sit down and have a neat pour with. But uh, for a mixer, I think they're great. Um, 
especially stuff like American honey and American honey sting because they're made with, with, with bourbon. So, you, you know, you're mixing bourbon and honey and like ghost pepper in the case of, of sting. So you're getting a more true to Kentucky kind of like fireball is just Canadian whiskey. You know, it's just young Canadian whiskey blended with, with tons of cinnamon flavoring. And, and if you like that, that's fine. Um, it's more of a shooter, you know, um, yeah. I'm sure there are some cocktails you can craft with it, but with American honey, not so much the sting. I think I'd probably consider sting a shooter myself. Um, but with American honey, which Jimmy Russell was the first to invent a flavored bourbon. No one had ever made a flavored bourbon before Jimmy did it. And Jimmy did it in the seventies to try to introduce bourbon to another audience. Uh, you know, some, some of that being female, which was, you know, bourbon was never a big female thing back in the seventies. So it was, he was trying to bring in a different audience, some younger folks, um, you know, legal drinking age, of course, but, um, just to bring in a different crowd, people that found bourbon to be harsh or heavy, or were kind of put off by the whole 101 proof thing, uh, to have a, 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 a liqueur, uh, was, was new. A bourbon based liqueur was new. Uh, so American honey to me is a very classic representation of bourbon liqueur. It works great in a hot toddy, especially when you bounce it out with like, you know, do like half 101, half American honey. Um, it works in a lot of different cocktails. You can use it as the sweetening element if you want to try it in an old fashioned or something simple like that. Um, I like blending. Uh, I've said this so many times, but I don't know if you guys have tried Pursuit United yet. Uh, have not. Uh, no. It's you really recently hit to. down here. Yeah, it's recently hit down at the Specs downtown, so yeah. I need to pick up a bottle of that. It's good stuff. I mean, it will it will surprise you how good it is for the age. And uh, to mix three different states of, of, of bourbon there, you know, is, is quite interesting. No one's done that, uh, to my knowledge, where they mix, you know, the... the Indiana. Indiana. Mm-hmm. Is it Indiana, Kentucky, and New York, I believe. Um so, and it's not, uh, or it's Tennessee, right? No, it's, t- it's not, oh, it's, it's not Indiana. Oh, it's not it's, Indiana. It's right. Okay. Right. It's Kentucky, Tennessee, and I believe New York. Okay. Um, but, uh, the way they did it and it's not Dickel either. So it's a, it's a different Tennessee. That'll so, make people happy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's a really good blend. Anyway, I like taking that in like two parts and then putting one part American honey. And for some reason, Pursuit United works really well with American honey. I don't know what it is but I've tried it with other bourbons and it just doesn't click the same. Okay. So I highly recommend, uh, American honey blended, uh, as one to two parts with, uh, with pursuit United. That's cool. And, That's and cool. You said one part of the American honey, one part two American parts. honey is what okay. I do in two parts to, to pursuit okay. United. Okay. But okay. I mean, everybody has their own preference. If you want it sweeter, you can do more American honey. If you want it less sweet, you do less American honey. Okay. Well, I, I've I've actually never owned a bottle of American Honey, so I don't even know what it tastes like. But uh, uh, I could see it being, you know, pretty solid in a cocktail. I mean, that yeah, it, it makes works. sense. You know, what's yeah. the proof? Is that under ninety? It's seventy-one. Oh, is it really? Oh, I yeah, guess it has. A, yeah, it's 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 a liqueur, so yeah, it yeah, can yeah, be yeah. you know what yeah. it would. But yeah. it it uh like I said, it works great in a hot toddy or a cocktail. Um, yeah. I wouldn't drink it. A lot, of, a lot of people like it in sweet tea. They'll put it in sweet tea or unsweet tea as a sweetening that. element. Um, and that works good. I tried it in tea one time, and I thought it was fine. It just wasn't really my jam. But, uh, you know, view it like uh, some people do like what uh, Crown Royal peach and tea or something. So it's like that, the same type of thing. It's good, good little mixer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned your book, and, and you know, I had to go out and, and, and get it. And it's a fantastic oh, thank you. read. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh he gave it to me on Thursday night, and uh, he's like, yeah, just go ahead and read this. <laughs> I said, it's, it's, it's an easy read. My wife laughed at me because we were actually out of town for, for a few days uh, about two weeks ago. And, I I mean, I got into it. I mean, obviously, it's a whiskey guy reading it, uh, but I couldn't put it down, man. It was a lot of fun to read it, just kind of the stories that I never knew about. And that was going to be one of the things I, I mentioned to you or asked you. Did did you go into to, you know wanting to do this book? kind of knowing about the Rippy family and all that history and kind of realizing that in today's world, when people think Turkey, they just think Jimmy uh, and the Russell family, rightfully so. I mean, all the decades they've been there doing this, but I didn't know, you know, the history before Jimmy I, came on either, board and right? kind of how he came on board. And I thought that was just great. I didn't, I didn't know it very well 
I knew it some because when I started the blog, I, I got interested uh, in, in learning about the history, but I never really, you know, fleshed it out. And uh, one night, uh, I think it was 2000, late 2018 or so, my wife was like, you know, you really ought to write a book. You know, you're writing all this stuff in your blog all the time. And, you know, why don't you just do a book? And I was like, I can't do that. I'm not an author. I've never written a book. That just, it just sounded so, you know, no way kind of thing. And I got to thinking about it and I'm like, well, she is right. I mean, I do write every day. And so what's the difference in writing a little bit every day and, and completing a blog post and writing every day and completing, and completing a book? It's just like eating an elephant, you know, it's the one bite at a time thing. So I, I sat down, I gave it a go and, you know, it just started kind of each day progressed a little bit more than the, the one before it. And I got into the research, which really the most shocking thing about the history is that there's so many sources that are incorrect out there. You really have to like triple verify. Like you have to like, you can't just find a blog post or a magazine article and trust that everything in it is accurate. You've got to then take that information and compare it to other sources and see if that's right. So nailing down dates that things happened. I mean, I even found a couple instances where the history wall in the distillery is incorrect. Oh, and wow. um, I had to point that out to the, and I had the, you know, the, the uh, documentation to back it up. So, you know, it was a lot of getting in touch with the secretary of state of Kentucky and trying to figure out when entities were changing names and purchased by whom and this type of stuff. So it was a lot of research that went into it, a lot of nitty gritty, um, that, uh, you know, I didn't expect when I first started writing it. But when you're writing a book, the last thing you want to do is put out something that's inaccurate because it, it ruins your credibility. And, 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 and every author needs to be given a little bit of flexibility. I mean, you can't always be perfect, especially when you're interviewing people and you're using the information that they gave you. Sure. Um, but you want to try to be as accurate as possible. Um, and that was the toughest part about that. I mean, I even had it where... The book was done. I had the manuscript all ready to go, edited at the publisher, and I found out one or two things, and I'm like getting in touch with my publisher. I'm like, whoa, whoa, stop the presses. Wait. I got to rewrite this one part. I just found out the thing. I'm sorry. You know, so uh, it, it's, a lot of, uh, it's a lot of work and research that goes into it, but it was fun. So it was fun. I learned a lot. How long did it take you to, to, you know, talking about all that research and going through, you know, the state and everything, how long did it take you to, to finally complete the book? Well, and did I you have about, a did you have a time frame that you say I'll I'll knock this out in a year and it, it ended up taking a lot more? Yeah, oh yeah, it took a lot longer than I thought. Okay. I mean, I knocked the manuscript out within a year, and then I thought, okay, in a couple months I'll have a book because yeah. my goal was like to I think I was done with the manuscript initially in March or April of 2019, and the goal was to have it impressed and ready to go by September for Jimmy's 65th anniversary, and nice. and Fred Minnick told me. <laughs> Dude, you just, there's no way, there's no way. And my publisher told me there's no way. And I'm like, there's a way that we can do this. We got a few months. And then like, I started realizing what the book publishing process is all about. And whatever amount of time you think it's going to take, it's like going to be two or three times that. So um, there's a lot of uh, little, little moving parts that have to be satisfied. So it took a while and then it didn't help that when it finally was time to get them printed, it, you know, COVID had hit and the, I had to get them printed domestically, which is why it's a, a soft cover. It, should, it was originally supposed to be a hard cover, but uh, they would have sat in China for six months to a year. Oh, and man. I just, I didn't, I, I didn't want it that to happen. So yeah. I was like, let's just, let's just roll with it as a soft back. And the second edition will be a hard back. Yeah. As will my next book. Is it still going to be on Turkey? Yep. My next book. Okay. Yep. It, it's, it's, well, my next book is, is it's, uh, it's not completely new material. I'm doing a book called wild Turkey musings. It was like, there was a Kickstarter that was successfully funded. Thanks to so many of you out there. Um, but it's going to be a celebration of my fifth anniversary of my blog. Okay. So I've gone through and pulled all my favorite blog posts and, and, kind of edited them and added some additional information. Little each each entry has kind of a journal entry before it that tells kind of what I was doing at the time, what I was thinking at the time, reflecting back on the post. Um, and so that'll be coming out next year. 
but I think I'm just going to do one run of that book and just kind of make it like a special, like a one-time release, uh, you know, just a celebration kind of thing, make it, I guess, a limited edition, unless for some reason there's some great demand to reprint it. Um, and then I'm going to shift my focus to the second edition of American Spirit and uh, getting getting the last couple of years added in there and some new information I've learned about the past uh, as well. Oh, that's, that's, awesome. that's great. Well, I want to make a comment because I, I love your writing style. I, oh, I, you. I you know, I, I know that's kind of a, I, I read a lot of reviews and things like that. And uh, just be honest, it's, it, it's awesome. It's very easy well, to read you. your, your, with the style that you write in. And I, I, I can appreciate that. I, I, I really appreciate that because one thing, uh, when I finished the book, I gave it to a few people to kind of give me their impression on it. And uh, I had one or two people that were published writers tell me, you know, I'm just not sure a publisher is going to want this. You know, this, this is, it's just not, it doesn't read like a history book. It's a little bit too personal. I don't really think anyone's going to be interested in this. I just wanted to be honest with you. And I was, I was really kind of let down by that. Um, and I, I, I remember there was about a 24 to 40 hour period where I was just really considering just like, well, there went that, you know, like I guess I won't <laughs> be doing a book. Yeah. And then I sat there and I'm like, you know what? Uh, fine, whatever. I'll just, I'll find a publisher that's willing to work with me and, um, and we'll, you know, we'll put it out there. And if, if people don't like it, they don't like it, you know, whatever yeah. I tried, you know, and uh, <laughs> the feedback was completely different of what I originally heard, which was, it was so easy to read. I related to it. Um, I could kind of go through the journey with you. And I'm like, wow, that, I mean, it's comments like that, reviews like that, that make me feel like I did the right thing. And I really appreciate it because yes, it's very, it's written in kind of an, an informal, formal style. Like I try to be, I try to write, you know, where it's acceptable, you know, in a formal sense, but at the same time, I'm going to use like hell and damn and, and, uh, you know, you know, break that, that window and kind of reach out to the audience there once in a while and say, well, here's what I'm thinking, you know? Yeah. Um, and I do those kind of things because that's kind of like if I were talking to someone, I write it more like if I were talking to someone and, and, and that's, that's what I, I was, prefer. I prefer that. And, yeah. and with uh, your blog, uh, you know, uh, reading your blog, this is a, I haven't gotten through the book yet, but, uh, uh, I've read your blog for a long time. And every time I read uh, an article in your blog or a view or like whatever, I'm just like, wow, this guy's a great writer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so. But but the way you said you were intended, intending it to come across is how I was going to describe how I take it is like, I'm not sitting in a room with you, but I kind of feel like I am. And you're, you're just kind of talking to me across the table, which I appreciate as well. I mean, I really enjoy well, that. It, it, it's like Bruce said, he said, you know, this is a fan's book. Yeah. Um, and it, and I mean, I, I right um, from the very beginning, from the introduction, I go ahead and tell you straight up, I'll Turkey fan. Like I wasn't always a wild Turkey fan and I make that clear, but I, I, I let everybody know that, you know, I did become a wild Turkey fan and I, I you know, I'm not trying to, uh, like I've never, well, I did get one review that was kind of eh, so, so on Amazon. And the guy was like, this book is, is very biased and, you know, I wish someone would write the history from a more objective point of view and all that. And I'm like, well, I didn't mislead anyone. Like I tried to tell everybody up front, you know, that, you know, I'm a fan of wild Turkey and this yeah. is my journey and I'm taking you on it. But I mean, I guess if, if, if that message wasn't clear, I apologize, but it is a fan's book. It's <laughs> not a, it's not a, uh, it's not like a college textbook. You know, I, it, it's got a lot of inflection in it and a lot of personality that's mine and, and some people might like it and some don't, but it really makes me happy that, that you guys picked up on that. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, it's like I'm trying to walk you through my journey uh, and make it yours as well. You know. Well, well, let's touch on that because people listening that may not be familiar with you, I know there's a lot who are, but those who aren't uh, might be hearing this and thinking, well, he's just a, a wild turkey guy or he works for wild turkey and you don't. But you, like you, you just kind of touched on, you didn't just – 
you haven't always just loved wild turkey. It was kind of an, right. an, an exploration for you. You you were kind of looking for what's the best bourbon out there, and, and you kind of came back to, to wild turkey. That's right. It it because when I when I, I mean I've enjoyed bourbon and American whiskey since the nineties. When, when I went to college, I, I enjoyed a Jim and Coke or a Jack and Coke, and I even liked you know like Crown and Coke. So you know I was fine with Canadian whiskey, but. Uh, it was always a mixer, you know, um, and it wasn't until like 2013 or so uh, when my brother-in-law introduced me to one of those fancy Crown Royal, you know, I think the XR or whatever on the rocks. And I was like, this is good. You know, like I didn't need Coke with it. You know, I, I, I thought this is, this is pretty fun. So I was like, you know, I'm going to like learn about whiskey. Like I just had this like, you know, desire to get a book and a magazine and kind of sit down and kind of figure out what makes it tick as a drink. And I went to the local store and I bought like a Jameson and like an Evan Williams single barrel. Like I went, I was getting like, you know, Scotch, Irish, Canadian, whatever I was, I was to me, I was exploring the different styles of uh, by geographical location kind of thing. And cause in my mind as a, as a novice, you know, I'm thinking all bourbon is bourbon, you know, all, all Canadians, Canadian, all Scotch, Scotch. And then you learn very quickly that that's not the case at all. Like, you know, there's no, you know, same Scotch, there's no same bourbon, you know, that type of thing. So when I settled into bourbon, I avoided wild turkey because I remembered wild turkey from college being like the shooter that everybody got hammered on. And I just thought it was like a rot gut type of, you know, bottom shelf pour. And I think a lot of people still think that. Um, that perception's changing, but not completely, you know, and on a checkout one day I was like, give me that little, you know, mini like 200 milliliter pint size wild Turkey. And I'll, uh, just review it for Reddit or whatever. Cause I originally started writing reviews for Reddit. And when I tasted it, I was like, Whoa, wait, this is, like, I really yeah. like this. I'm a well, is there something wrong with me? <laughs> I like this. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I started posting on Reddit about how awesome Wild Turkey 101 is, and I had someone reach out to me and say, hey, David. You guys with me? Yeah, we uh <laughs> now we got you. We got you. <laughs> where where to cut off at cuz I'll pick back up. You uh, you were talking about that uh, you picked up the Wild Turkey 101 and you went, "Man, I, I really like this." Okay. So I got the, I got the the Wild Turkey 101, you know, mini or whatever from the liquor store. Went back home, tried it and really enjoyed it and and, and thought about, you know, this is not at all what I thought it was and wrote a review on Reddit or talked about it on Reddit, and someone reached out to me, and they sent me some dusty wild turkey, a uh, cheesy gold foal, and a 1981 <laughs> 101-8-year. That's your and, favorite one, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the, the 81 101 is my sentimental favorite just because it's the one that the second I nosed that 81 101-8-year, I, 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 I was a wild turkey fan for life. Like, the second I nosed it, I was like, this is what I want every whiskey in my life to taste like. <laughs> and, uh, and I proceeded to try to find that profile in all of the modern wild turkey expressions. But the interesting thing is, of course, it's not there, and I learned that very quickly. But what I discovered in exchange was that the modern profiles were really, really good. And I'm like... It's not what I was hoping it would be, but it's just as good in my mind in a different way. So it didn't take me long to explore the range, uh, not just of modern, but of vintage uh, pours. Um, and it, it, it's there's just so many factors to wild turkey that made me fall in love with it. Um, you know, I, the profile being the first one, I love uh, the story of Jimmy and the Russells and, and there's, there's that legacy. It's not a family owned distillery, but it feels like a family owned distillery. Yeah. yeah. Great history. Um, and I don't want to give, give too much away from your book, but, uh, I'll just touch on, just make a quick point that 
Yeah. Uh, Jimmy's wife, what, what a part she played in, in getting him to, to join yeah. the Wild Turkey team. Yeah, Jaretta worked there before he did. Yeah. She was a secretary and and uh, made sure that, that, that Jimmy got in there. And I think she left after about seven years or so, but uh, she set him up really well and got him in with the right folks. And, and honestly, I mean, uh, Jimmy had the talent. He had the talent and the knowledge and the, the know-how and the, the, the personality to pull it off. Because, you know, it, it, there's a lot of distillers out there who are good at one thing. They're, they're very good at distilling or they're very good with PR, you know, um, or, or maybe they have just a good understanding of, of the whiskey business in general. They're big, good businessmen. Um, but Jimmy kind of like, he wore so many hats and he wore them well. It, it was, it, he was really like an ace of all trades. It's like no matter what they put Jimmy in, he, he could figure it out and do well at it. One of the few to survive the glut era and, uh, he did it by just not changing anything. He was like, yeah. no, we'll just keep doing what we're going to do. Yeah. And I mean, but that in itself is, is somewhat of a genius because it's like, he didn't get upset that, you know, <laughs> they rented those out. He didn't want those barrels in there. Um, and, uh, you know, so that was different. The revival is based on something that Jimmy did. They had a Sherry signature, which was basically bourbon that was blended with actual Sherry mm-hmm. and it was marketed overseas but what Eddie did was a different thing. And, and I would say a, a pretty ballsy move. Like, you know, Eddie just did like, you see a lot of Sherry finished bourbons. Yeah, okay? sure. But he took 12 to 15 year old barrels, 12 year barrels and some 15 year barrels and decided I'm going to finish these in Sherry. Now talk about, you know, some real guts uh, there, because yeah. that's some primo bourbon that you could have sold just as is, and people would have paid a lot of money for it. Um, but then to go and, and finish them in these sherry casks, anything could have happened, you know? Oh, yeah. That, and it wasn't like he was just dumping four-year in there. It's like, oh, well, that didn't work, you know? <laughs> um, but uh, it, and, and I will work, interrupt you well. uh, here. This is a uh, revival is the one of the few bourbons my wife will actually drink. Oh, it's great. <laughs> I can see why. It has its own. It has a very nutty kind of character to it uh you know those dried dried fruits dried nuts you know the prunes i mean all that stuff is is in there uh it's more whiny in some ways than bourbon-esque but then it still has that wild turkey bourbon backbone bone oh, real yeah. heavy in it you know it's it, and tobacco and just lovely lovely expression maybe maybe my favorite modern wild turkey of all time uh, just, I just think Eddie knocked it out the park with that one. Uh, he really did. Um, what'll be interesting is seeing what this next one's going to be like. Uh, the next one, of course I'm talking about is, is one yep. master's keep one, which is the toasted barrel finish. Uh, it is a straight bourbon. So that, that is a new charred toast. So yeah. it's a light char, you know, to toast it, uh, so that you keep that straight designation on there. Um, you know, aged in, in Rick House G. Uh, and you're looking at a range of like, originally they said eight, I think eight to 14 years. Now it's nine to 14 years is the, is the range. Ooh, and so, with that toasting, that's going to be a dark bird. <laughs> it should be dark. I, I, I got a feeling and uh, recently listened to a podcast with uh, Bruce and he mentioned about uh, the vanilla content is going to be significantly more than the typical wild turkey. So, um, I, I'm kind of taking that it will be very sweet. Traditionally, with toasted bourbons, I get a lot of toasted marshmallow. Um, so I'm guessing we're going to get some of that, but who knows? We've never had a wild turkey that's been toasted, and it's going to have 14-year whiskey in it. So, you know, you've got other whiskeys that do the toasted barrel thing, but usually that, that whiskey's around, I think, Elijah Craig's, what, eight years or so for their yeah. toasted? Yeah. Something like that, eight to ten, somewhere around there. And uh, I don't know what Michter's does for their toasted, but it wouldn't surprise me if it's a similar range, I would imagine. Yeah, I think you, know, uh, you got the years. Woodford in the 1910, and they, right. they did. I don't know how long all that is in there. So so, so how does it affect a, a mature bourbon, you know, aged in, in wood-clad rickhouses, traditional rickhouses, because, you know, Woodford uses, uh, you know, the heat-cycled mm-hmm. warehouses. So it'll be interesting to 
have this experience, a lot of people are like, oh, this is just a trend. You know, this is just everybody's done toasted. It's like, yeah, but I don't think anybody's done this toasted yet. Yeah. I don't think they've done bourbon that was aged naturally in Rick House for this long. Um, you know, and they work with ISC on this. So, you know, independent stave, yeah. you know, guided them in this process with with the with the staves and everything uh to to get the right char all that kind of stuff so um i say staves barrels actually these were new you know charred barrels mm-hmm. so um you know we'll see what happens but uh to all the naysayers of the toasted if you like makers le's which i do remember that those are toasted you know oh yeah a lot of I'm people don't like to think fan. of them as toasted bourbons yeah. but they are I, yeah, I mean, they have staves added to them. Toasted you know, staves it, added it, to them. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, we yeah. just did a barrel pick, actually, over at uh, Maker's Mark, and it was yeah. really fun. It was a lot of fun. It's a little science project to go through and do that. That was, that was interesting. Yeah, they, it's good stuff. I really like their private selection program. Yeah. I think it's really unique. It's fun. Uh, you know, and again, it's toasted. So yeah. anybody that's like, wow, they're just, they're just like, you know, Calm down and just wait till you taste it. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. right. Exactly. We'll see. If it's not good, it's not good. You know. And, but you, you got to give it to Eddie for pushing the envelope a little bit with a mm-hmm. with a more traditional type of bourbon company that you know has two mash bills and you know produces their product uh, to do the finishing like in revival or doing the toasted. Right. You know that's. Well, but well, I I have a question for you, David, uh, mm-hmm. and maybe you know the answer, maybe you don't. Uh, kind of a dynamic between Jimmy and Eddie mm-hmm. was, was there any pushback from Jimmy when the entry level the entry proof was, was wanting to be raised a couple of times? You know, I would have ima- my, you know, I've never had that conversation with Jimmy. I would imagine that, uh, it, it would be something that Jimmy would not have really wanted initially yeah. because for so, you know, Jimmy's about doing things one way, and doing it right, tradition. doing it the way, tradition, the way, the, the way that he's always done it. Now, at that point in time, Eddie was, uh, well, he was an associate master distiller to all, I think around 2007, but he was, you know, he's, he, his responsibilities were growing. And I, I guess at some point in time, they had a discussion with them and said, look, you know, from what I understand, uh, you know, a lot of their barrels were shooting under proof, you know, they, they weren't, like rare, it was, you know, Eddie was asked this on bourbon pursuit and he said, you know, it came down to making rare breed batches and they were barely able to pull out 108 proof. Um, and he said it took going to the top of the Rick house and getting six year barrels and then, uh, you know, kind of trying to balance them out with lower, uh, uh, you know, lower floor barrels Mm -hmm. of higher age to try to, get some kind of where it's not super tannic, you know, um, too much char kind of thing. And it was, it was really difficult to come up with a barrel proof batch that looked like a barrel proof whiskey because it was just have, they were having a hard time getting that proof up there. Um, and so they had some discussions about raising the barrel entry proof and they tried it at 110 for a year or two and then ultimately settled on 115. And now Eddie has a lot more control over the product. So he can, he can have a, a rare breed that actually looks like a decent barrel proof whiskey, but it's not just about getting it right on the label. It, you know, you're looking, he's looking for a certain profile. He's looking for a certain flavor. Um, and you know, if I recall correctly, independent stave did a study and, and found 115 to be the ideal or the optimal barrel entry proof. So, um, right now they're operating under, what's considered to be the optimal barrel entry proof. Now, yes, a lower barrel entry proof does typically produce flavors that are generally considered more palatable. Um, They're sweeter. You just don't get as as much product out of it as you do uh, of having the higher proof. And it was funny one time, I I think it was Michael Beach, uh, we were talking about uh, on social media about barrel entry proof. And he had mentioned that Parker Beam had said he would he would enter the barrel at 135 if he could. <laughs> <But> <laughs> they won't let him. So, you know, yeah. it's everybody's got their preferences. Um, but um, you know, I'm not sure what those discussions were like back when that would have been when Pernod owned Wild Turkey and what right. those discussions. But I know that that rare breed and just having a 
a, a substantial proof, being able to maintain that proof. Um, you got to think you're batching 101. And if you got a lot of barrels that are under 101, well, by default at that time, they just went to, uh, you know, the 80, the 80 proof, you know, cause yeah. it's like, well, we ain't going to make the cut, you know? Yeah. So again, you know, it, it has to do with product diversification. If you're going to expand your portfolio, you've got to be able to have products that span a range in flavor and proof. I think that it brings me to a question that, I, that we were having this discussion beforehand. And, uh, you know, I know you have a specific question about quote unquote dusties. Um, but is this a factor in that flavor profile? You know, Absolutely. That, it, 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 cause I'm thinking, you know, just, just naturally just, this is just my not so educated mind on the subject thinking that, I think you get those sweeter vanilla notes at like a 107 entry proof. Um, yeah. Is that part of the reason that the, yes. the older bottles have that sweetness to it? It is definitely part of the reason. There are multiple reasons why um, dusty whiskey, not just wild turkey, tastes the way it does. Um, and we could probably talk for an hour just on that. Sure. I will recommend to your listeners um, – to go to Michael Veach's website called bourbonbeach.com and search for old bourbon bottle flavor. There's a post he has called old bourbon bottle bottle flavor. And it kind of goes through the main reasons why old whiskey tastes the way it does. Um, and there's a lot of reasons just to, just to give you a few. We have that lower barrel entry proof. You had river water being used or in some distilleries cases, spring water being used. Uh, that now everybody's using reverse osmosis water stuff. So when they talk about the Kentucky rivers, our water source, it's like, yeah, but it goes to the water plant. And, gets, <laughs> you know, and so, you know, everybody's using reverse osmosis water. Um, you had the old fermentation tanks that were made out of cypress wood and now they're made out of stainless steel and they're larger. So they hold more. Yeah. And uh, the still like wild turkey has a new still. Uh, it's not the old still that they used to use. Um, yeasts have changed over time. I don't care how perfectly you keep it. it you know, over decades, yeasts are going to change, especially a long time ago. They were, you know, it was a lot harder to keep those locked down uh, the way that they do now. I'm not a scientist, so, you know, I can't really explain what it is, but I know that yeast change. Um, and I'll tell you something Eddie told me that he said, you know, somebody asked him one time, you know, why dusty whiskey or dusty turkey specifically tastes the way it does. He said, you know, y'all, there's just a lot of older whiskey in it. So it might say wild turkey 101 eight year, but there could be 15 year whiskey in that thing just because it was the glut and they just had all these barrels. And it's like when a barrel reached its prime, you had to do something with it. And wild turkey did not have a lot of expressions back in the eighties. So, you know, in it went. So it went into yeah. the 101, 8 or 12 year and they called it a day, you know, and, you know, they didn't, they weren't thinking about premium bourbons. That wasn't a thing until, you know, Elmer took it to uh, Japan, you know, and then of course, Wild Turkey followed along, but even that was a limited market. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. they were still having to, to produce 101 domestically. So, you know, Dusty Whiskey, a lot of different reasons for Wild Turkey, one of the biggest reasons is that glut era just has a lot of older whiskey. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, one thing that's striking between the older releases and the modern for me, and I'm a big, you know, mouthfeel texture kind of person. Uh-huh. And that, and that older stuff just has a mouthfeel that just feels like it's older, you know? I, it, well, it also wasn't chill filtered. They didn't it, start chill filtering. I think until I think the early two thousands is when they started. Okay. Yeah. Chill filtering that would the make whiskey. sense. So, I mean, not all, you know, Russell's Reserve single barrel isn't chill filtered and a lot of the LEs aren't chill filtered, but, uh, you know, for the most, the 101, the Kentucky Spirit, you know, these are the 81, uh, these are chill, rare breed even, chill filtered products. Yeah. Well, here, here's a question on Dusty's. Is Dusty's, are, are they a moving target? Will they continue to be around? Will we, you know, continue to have that classification or, or are they going to kind of, you know, go away and well, Dusty's will be no a, more? There's a post on my blog called What's a Dusty? And I think you first have to ask yourself what's a Dusty. And a Dusty is always going to be a relative term. It, it'll sure. never be a finite term. So a Dusty 50 years from now is not going to be the same thing as a Dusty today. So uh, you have to kind of ask yourself what's a Dusty. Um, 
you know, I think people will always want to pay for something that isn't around anymore. Um, I mean, hell, there's a market on like Nintendo games. If I had yeah. known that like a Legend of Zelda, you know, from Duck like Hunter. when I was a kid, yeah, I would have kept that Joker. Oh my but gosh. I didn't, you know. But now somebody wants a lot of money for it. And it's like we used to like blow on them and like, oh, yeah. you know, take Q-tips in them and like bang on them and throw them across the room. We were mad at them, you know. And uh, now somebody wants to pay hundreds of dollars for a yeah. cartridge, you know, and they even have companies that will grade them. Like you can send your cartridge off and they'll, they'll grade the condition of the cartridge. <laughs> yeah. you know? and it's like, I've seen it. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah. I think there was like a Pawn Stars episode where this guy brought yeah. in like a Super Mario Brothers and he wanted a million dollars for it. Or yeah. something. <laughs> I'm like, golly, we used to just like, you know, treat, abuse the hell out of them things, you know? And, well, uh, Anyway, so there's always going to be a market for old. There's always going to be a market for for things that don't, you know, aren't easily found anymore. And that's kind of my thought. I, I my my thought is it's going to be a, a moving target because for that reason. But you know, I think about like uh, rare breed, and, and when you look at the history of rare breed, how it's changed, and you know, the the proof has continued to change every so often, and, and right. I and and just processes, you know, with distillation and things like that what what's the future hold I, i'm not sure so you know i i was having a conversation with carter talking about man I, i'm almost tempted to take uh you know two or three bottles of rare breed and just put it away for a while and you know my son's yeah. 20 when he gets a little older 15 years down the road maybe crack one with him and see what's on the market currently and kind of compare you know this era keep, yeah not to keep plugging my blog but there's a post called whiskey time capsule okay. and it's, that is what that post is about it's about not don't worry about the pappies don't worry about birthday bourbon don't even worry about master's keep look find a couple bottles that you just enjoy on a regular basis 101 rare breed russell's 10 or evan williams black label or whatever you know and take one of each of them and just put them in a cabinet close it up and just leave it there don't even even if you run out so let's say you run out of 101 don't pull it out of that cabinet. Go and get you another one. It's not hard to find and just let it sit. And then before you know it, two, three, five, seven, eight, you know, 12 years is going to go by and you're going to have a dusty cabinet. You know, it's going to be dusty bourbons just, you know, from being over 10 years old. Cause to me, when you start crossing that 10 year mark, you're looking at something not easily found anymore. Um, and then you can do what you're talking about doing is, Hey, you know, find a special occasion, you know, and, you know, son's 21st birthday or, you know, a friend's getting married or, you know, whatever. And you go, Hey, you know what? I got this bottle. I put back in this thing 15 years ago. I'm, I've been wondering what it tastes like. Let's do it. You know? Um, yeah. And, and, and then you can have fun with it and you didn't spend a lot of money. So it's exactly. like, yeah, you know, it's like you spent 30 bucks, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and like everybody else is like wanting to open that bottle and they're paying a ton, you know, couple hundred dollars for it even if it's a standard label i mean look at how much people are paying for like just like okay for example that label you have on on the table there the wild yeah. turkey now that's the export but the domestic version is pretty similar without the eight um people are paying premiums for those and like just a couple of years ago i could still find those around town yeah like just sitting just, on the shelf yeah and, and and so i bought a bunch of them you know uh, when i had the opportunity but uh you know it it's it's just time changes everything. So do it now and you can enjoy it later and not pay a premium. And, you know, and then if, if for some reason it's not very good, you didn't spend a lot of money on it. Cause isn't that disappointing when you pay a premium on something and you're like, well, Oh man, it is not all that great. huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I got two more questions for you. Uh, one, do you have any insight on the rare breed? Do you see that changing you know, over, over the history or the, the life of this product? You, you kind of see that, being tweaked a little bit every so many years and, and it's kind yeah. of been on this 116.8 for a few years now. So do, yeah. you, do you see that kind of being played with? Uh, probably the, the, the oldest or longest running batch is uh batch uh, RB. Oh gosh. Why am I drawing a blank on this? Uh, oh, it's the, it ran for about nine years and um, it was the 108.4 uh, or 108.2 batch. And, um, O three RB, that's what it was. O three RB. And, uh, so O three RB ran for nine years and then they had the one twelve point eight, and that ran for like, I don't know, three years or so, yeah. something like that. Uh, and then they, it might've even been two years. It, it was, 
just a couple of years. And then they did the 116.8. Um, well, there's two things. One is uh, there is a 116.8 version that's NCF and it's travel retail only. So if you're flying outside the country, go to the travel retail stores, uh, you might just find it. It's in, it's in a box. It's a liter size bottle. It's oh, wow. a liter rare breed. Um, it has like a charcoal colored box and it says very clearly on it, non-chill filtered. Mm. So um, there's that one to be on the lookout for now. So if you want a slightly different version of what we have Absolutely. already, yeah, that'd be cool. there you go. Um, that is going to eventually, from what I've been told, eventually hit the domestic market. Right now it's a travel retail exclusive, but I, I think Eddie had mentioned one time that after a couple years, like two years or so, that deal with the travel retail exclusive it, with it being a, a, an exclusive will kind of go away and then they'll, they'll roll it out domestically. Um, second thing is there was a promotional picture going around from the official wild Turkey social media handles, uh, Instagram, maybe even Twitter, where it was like a picture of several different expressions. And somebody realized that if you zoom in to the neck of rare breed, it, the proof is one eighteen. Um, oh. So, you know, I haven't been told anything different. I haven't heard about anything different, but it was interesting. So either someone Photoshopped it for the hell of it, um, or um, maybe there's something new coming around the corner. I don't know. Uh, there is a, a Instagram com a Campari community event scheduled for later this month, and uh, I'm gathering up some questions for – that event. And one of the questions from one of my Patreon supporters is, is that 118? Uh, <laughs> is it real batch? Is that real or <laughs> what? So it'll be interesting to yeah. see what happens with that. So uh, we'll have to see. I would imagine it's going to change okay. at some point in time, you know, uh, uh, it, why not? Yeah. That's, sure. That was kind of my thought, but I just, you being, uh, I'll say on the inside a little bit, uh, I thought you might be able to have some, some <laughs> insight. Yeah, uh, my we'll last, see. my last question is, uh, can you give me a reason or convince me, or maybe I'm just missing the boat. Um, I've never owned a bottle of Kentucky spirit. Uh, I've okay. always been, you know, Hey, I, I can get the Russell's reserve 10 or, or I even at one one proof. I really like, you know, just the wild Turkey one one Is there something I'm missing that I should be buying that bottle? Yes and no. Okay. Okay. So it's, you know, I like how Nick from Breaking Bourbon phrased this yesterday. That Breaking Bourbon just posted a review of Kentucky Spirit. And Nick said, so I, I like Nick's reviews. And Nick said something that just really kind of, so I'm like, damn it, I should have thought of that, Nick. Um, <laughs> but he said, in some ways, or many ways, or some, some kind of phrasing like that, Kentucky Spirit is wild turkey in its truest form. And what he means by that is, Wild Turkey has traditionally been a 101 proof product. I mean, that that's that's the flagship. That's what they always bottled out back when Jimmy started. And uh, it's still their flagship to this day. They have a lot of other expressions, but 101 is, is their signature proof. So what you're getting with Kentucky Spirit is a single barrel at 101 proof. And some people call it 101 single barrel. And... I don't really think that's accurate because 101 is batched for a certain profile from six and a half year whiskey to anywhere from up to like hell 12, 13 years, whatever they've got barrels, you know, that's put in there. But generally about six to 10 year is what's going into 101. They say six to eight on the back, but you know, they need so much for long branch. So sometimes they pull from the 10. Um, so, that's 101. It's a batch. You know, you've got various ages working together from various floors, from various rickhouses to create this profile. One, I mean, a Wild Turkey Kentucky Spirit is a single barrel. So you're getting, you know, one barrel from one specific rickhouse, from one specific floor, and it could be, it's at least eight years. Uh, Kentucky Spirit is, is one where they, they don't go any lower than eight years with it. So, it's at least eight, eight, at least eight years, but I've seen Kentucky spirits as old as 13 years, um, legit 13 year Kentucky spirit barrels. Um, and you know, they're not batched or anything cause it's a single barrel. So you're getting like, this is what, you know, Jimmy and Eddie put in the barrel. This is what sat there for X many years. And now you're tasting it. Um, 
at their signature proof. You're not tasting it at barrel proof. You're not tasting it at 110. You know, you're getting it at that signature 101 proof, which is Jimmy's preferred, you know, proof. So I like how Nick phrased that it was kind of like wild turkey in its truest form because it has this element of, uh, you know, being kind of true to the the tradition of wild turkey and, and what Jimmy started, that legacy there. Now, I'll say that in comparison to Russell's Reserve Single Barrel, uh, Russell's Reserve Single Barrel has a higher floor, uh, but, uh, you know, Kentucky Spirit has just as high of a ceiling but a lower floor. So it's like, you know, you kind of it, you kind of have to either get lucky or you have to taste some samples and go, oh, I like that one. Okay. But I've had some Kentucky Spirits that I would put up against any Russell's Reserve single barrel. Um, okay. Okay. It, it just depends on the barrel. Some barrels to me, not a lot, not this isn't the usual, but some barrels do shine better at 101 proof over 110. That's just the truth. Like I think that, you know, last year, for example, I think a lot of the E barrels, I preferred them as Kentucky Spirit. Same thing with S. I preferred a lot of the S barrels uh, as Kentucky Spirit instead of Russell's Reserve. I think they were more balanced. I think that in the case of E, that weird funky fruitiness uh, gets kind of uh, mellowed out into more like honey notes when it's Kentucky Spirit. And for the S, there's real like dry spice kind of what I call it granny's spice rack kind of flavors, they uh, they get sweetened up when you take it down to 101 over the 110 and you get more like, you know, like your caramels come forward and your brown sugar comes forward and the spices are still there, but they're, they're it's countered and uh, I think it makes for a better sipping experience. That's just my preference, but uh, don't write it off. Okay. Don't write it mm-hmm. off. And if you run across a, a bottle and you're curious, you can always send me a message, uh, I'd be happy to give you my opinion on whether I would buy it or try it or wait or whatever. Okay, perfect. I'll awesome. take you up on that. You you got something? No. Uh, well, uh, I have one more if you don't. Well, I okay. do. Uh, I perfect. do. I do have something. I know you're a fan of rye, uh, and yeah. you like the. Uh, I, I've heard you say you like the 101 rye, yeah. um, and I will admit I was a cornerstone. It was an expensive bottle. But I was a fanboy of that that product. I absolutely loved it. Now I'm just curious what your thoughts are on the rare breed, rare breed rye. Well, I want to take it a step further. Uh, rare breed versus the Russell tenure. Oh yeah, the rye. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I got. I'll, I'll answer both of them. So <laughs> rare breed rye to me is probably the most kick-ass core expression that wild turkey has come out with in years. Um, it just, it checks so many boxes. Um, it, it's, it's a great cocktail whiskey. Uh, you can sip it neat. It holds up to ice very, very well. Uh, and it's not so hard to find anymore. When it first came out, it was like you couldn't find it anywhere. It's not hard to find rare breed right now. I mean, you might have to reach out to a friend or something, but I mean, I've seen like pallets of it at Costco. I've seen my liquor store just overflowing with it. Mm-hmm. Um, it it's out there. Um, and for a four to eight year barrel proof, non chill filtered rye whiskey at 60 bucks or so um, with a, a heritage name behind it who actually made the whiskey. So this isn't like, you know, some MGP thing, whatever, you know, um, I think it's a steal. Um, it's not something I drink every day. Uh, I have to be in a mood for a rye, but I'm never disappointed by rare breed rye. Like it just, it, it checks all the boxes I need to check with it. And the proof doesn't, you know, like it, it's 112. So, you know, 112.2. So it's not really like super high proof, but it's not weak either. So it's like, it's really kind of easy to kind of dial it in if you need to with a little ice or water or whatever but it's perfectly fine as is you know at full barrel strength too yeah it quickly uh when it came out i don't know hit the market a year year and a half ago whenever it was it quickly shot up uh the list for me as far as rise that i really enjoy drinking and doing it in a couple of blinds it it finished that way as well you know yeah it, it it really competes with a lot of the stuff out there that costs like twice 
yeah. its price. So, uh, right. And then as for rear breed versus Russell's 10, uh, you know, um, I'm more of a Russell's 10 fan now. Okay. I would have answered that question differently a couple of years ago. I would have said rear breed. Um, trust me, I love rare breed. It gets plenty of love at my house. I buy plenty of bottles of it, but, uh, I have to kind of, if it's, if uh, I like to write at night and, you know, I have to kind of have my wits about me and a barrel proof bourbon, uh, means I'm limited to a very small portion, you know, over a, over a, a fairly decent window. And I don't usually like to do that. I usually like to kind of have a, a pour or two over a few hours and, Russell's 10 allows me to do that and, and, and keep my wits about me. Um, and I just like the maturity, the profile of it too. So Russell's 10 has this like nice, like cherry oak leather kind of profile, very much like Eagle rare with a little more spice. Um, so, uh, I would pick that, but that's just a personal preference. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having rare breed at night. If that's what you want to, um, middle of the day, I probably wouldn't pour Russell's 10. I'd probably pour rare breed. So, you know, if I was, if I was, you know, cooking some hamburgers out on the grill or something, I would probably reach for 101 or rear breed. I would not reach for Russell's 10 grilling out. I, I tend to go a little bit, uh, you know, I, well, I take that back. I'll, I like long branch outside, so it's not so much proof, but, um, Russell's 10 to me is more of a night pour, more of a sitting down, kind of doing my writing kind of thing. Um, outside, if I'm wanting low proof, I think something like long branch and if I want something higher proof, I look at you know, one and one a rare breed. Okay. What else do you have, Carter? No, go ahead. Finish. <laughs> um, I, I had a question just on the top of my mind and forgive me, David, cause I just, uh, Oh, labeling. I wanted to talk. You uh -huh. mentioned, uh, you know, in today's world, we all, you know, whether it's uh, a steak, we want to know where that cow was, you know, where he was, yeah. what pasture was he in? What was he eating? How old was he? And all that kind of stuff. Everything's kind of driven that way today. I told Carter earlier, I think it's a, uh, it's okay to be a nerd anymore because we're, we're all kind of nerds about everything that we, we do. We want to provenance. Yeah. You want it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, well, I wrote a post about it uh, called Rick house blues. That's and what I was going to reference. Yeah. My frustration with Campari. Sorry if you're listening Campari, but you know, I'm, I'm kind of fed up with having to figure out where the hell the, the barrel came from. You know, you've got, you know, six Rick houses, a through F, Camp Nelson, you got six Rick houses, A through F, Tyrone, and you got three Rick houses, A through C and McBrayer. Which A is A and which B is B and which C is C? Is it that hard to kind of let us know that, that you know, uh, campus prefix there every time? And, uh, you know, then with Kentucky Spirit, you're given the Rick, but you're not given the floor. You're given the bottle date, but you're not given the distilled date. And a lot of this stuff means something, um, you know, to a great many Enthusiasts, if not the grand majority, are all for more information. And like, you know, look, you don't have to like give us every single minute detail. It doesn't take a lot. I think if we just had the right campus every time, the right floor every time, the right barrel number every time, and the right age, most people would be perfectly happy with that. You know, yeah. we don't need the rack or the position or that. It, that, that stuff is really kind of not necessary, but um, at least to me. Yeah. But I'm frustrated by it because I've seen, y'all don't know, I mean, <laughs> I get so many emails, direct messages, uh, messages via Discord, and I trust me, I'm, I'm not frustrated with the people sending them, okay? I'm happy to help you. I'm frustrated with Campari because this is a, fix, a fixable problem, you know, but I'm getting all these questions like, Hey, I got an F. Is it Tyrone F or Camp Nelson F? <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, I have to kind of walk them through the possibilities. And even, and I have to stress it, even I can't be 100% sure. Yeah. You know, like there is always that chance that, you know, some barrel got pulled out of some oddball rickhouse for some reason. And uh, again, I'm not frustrated with the people asking because they genuinely want to know. Um, but I am frustrated that there's, we're not doing anything about it. Like, you know, this is, this means something, you know, it it's like, yeah. and, and it's, and the information is already there. It's in the spreadsheet. It exists. You know, it's like, it's not like they're going to have to redo the whole program to go get that information. It's on a spreadsheet. Just find a way to get it from that spreadsheet to the label. 
and then everybody will be happy. Yeah. You know? And it doesn't seem that, oh. like to your point, uh, that hard a problem to fix. And, uh, no. you know, whether it's wine or, or even coffee nowadays, people want to know, you know, single origin coffee. It, where, even where if you were to say, from? like, uh, on the label, it, even if you, it, you're like, oh, well, we don't want to change the label. How about a neck tag? <laughs> I mean, yeah. just something, you know. <laughs> something, something. And, and, you know, I do have a problem with the neck tags because you can swap them out and this yeah. kind of yeah, thing. That, but, I mean, but but you should just give us a little bit more information. And, you know, I, I'm not trying to, you know, bash Campari at all. A lot of people, they like to, you know, come down on, you know, Campari and say, well, because of them, this and that. And whatever. But honestly, if you look back from 2009 to where we are today, which is 2009 is when Campari purchased Wild Turkey, you know, everything's just gone up. We've got more expressions, more variety. We've got more single barrels. We've got more LEs. We've got a higher quality product, more, more consistent product. Even the 81 is consistent. Like the 80 from like the Pernod days is not very good. It's very inconsistent. I've had good bottles and I've had awful drain pour bottles. Sorry, but it's true. Yeah, red um, yeah. The 81 is very consistent. It's like a beam white type of product, but you get what you get and it's going to be right. And, you know, so everything has, and the, and the pricing, people complain, you know, master's keeps going up from 150 to 175. I got gotcha. you. But look at the, look at the bourbon market today. I mean, they'd be leaving money on the table, you know, to, to, to price it, you know, any lower, honestly. I mean, it, it's their business at the, at the end of the day, uh, uh, what's the quote? You know, it's a bourbon business, not a bourbon charity. I think Bernie Lovers <laughs> or something, someone yeah. said that. Um, I, I mean, that's true. And, and, um, but their core products, which is what the most consumers, majority consumers, the mass, you know, non enthusiast consumers, that's what they care about is the core products are, are not priced anything crazy. I mean, you can get 101 for like some places in the teens. I mean, it's like twenty four ninety nine here. Nineteen ninety nine places, here. Yeah, some yeah. of have nice. I've seen people have it on sale for fifteen dollars. I'm like, that's insane, you know. Yeah. In Russell's ten year, a ten year old bird, like people chase Eagle Rare and pay premiums for it. In some places, not everywhere, but like Russell's ten can be found for thirty, thirty five dollars. You know, on the, on the yeah. shelf all the time. On the shelf all the time. So, yeah. you know, there's not a whole lot to complain about. Um, you know, with any company, you're going to have a large company, a, a lot of times foreign companies, you're going to have a lot of bureaucracy. You're going to have a lot of, of, uh, it getting from point A to point B in the company is very difficult, you know, but while Turkey is doing well, they're making quality whiskey, um, and it's priced well for the most with the exception of a few LEs that are hard to find in this type of thing. I, I don't like to give Campari a hard time because I think they've done nothing but improve the brand since they purchased it. Last question. I know you need to get going, but uh, did did whiskey come first, then cigars, or were you a cigar guy? Because anybody <laughs> who follows you on Twitter, I mean, you, you you seem to every Friday have a... That's a new thing for me, oh, man. That's a new thing. So, okay. Yeah. So, so I, you know, it hasn't been that long, maybe two months or so. Um you know, I had always kind of been interested in kind of dabbling in it, but never really trying it. And uh, my father-in-law told me, because we, uh, I had given him a, cig a cigar, you know, for um, special occasions, birthday, I, it was Christmas. I'd, I'd thrown it in, you know, a, a cigar I picked up for him. And uh, he was like, man, I've, I've, I've really been enjoying some cigars lately. And I said, really? And he's like, oh, yeah, I've been you know, going outside and just kind of sitting there and listening to the birds. And I just really enjoy doing that. Well, so he used to smoke cigarettes like, you know, daily and he had to stop uh, because of his health. Um, and that was years ago. And he's been off, you know, smoking for I mean, cigarettes for, for years now, but he just recently started appreciating cigars. You don't inhale cigars, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, it kind of, got me interested. I like my father-in-law a lot. And uh, I was like, you know, I think I'm going to, you know, I'll admit, you know, well, my wife being okay with my father-in-law doing it, it was kind of <laughs> like in my head, I'm like, Hmm, doors maybe open. She won't be, maybe, maybe she'll be okay with me doing it. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, I signed up for cigar club, plug the cigar club.com. Uh, I signed up for my father-in-law and I signed up for me and uh, started getting some cigars in the mail. And, uh, I have to say it's become 
quite the little rabbit hole for me. Um, I've done a lot of research, watched a lot of YouTube videos, um, and it's something I can do to kind of escape from whiskey for a little bit because uh, I can't drink whiskey during the day, number one. So I wake up in the morning, you know, I can't just, you know, pour me. I guess I could, but I, I say. You, <laughs> you can't, I can't drive my kids to school yeah. and pick my kids to school. I mean, you can't, you can't have a, uh, a very healthy lifestyle that way. Yeah. Um, but what I can do is, is I can brew me a nice cup of coffee. I can go outside, you know, I can light up a stick and I can sit out there for an hour and listen to the birds and think about what I'm going to write that day. Think about what my goals are for the day. Um, kind of get my, my thoughts gathered and, uh, go in and execute. It also gives me time to catch up on my emails and social media messages and these types of things. Uh, and, and still appreciate something in the process. So, you know, I can enjoy my coffee, my cigar and catch up up on my messages and emails. So it's a good, it's a good little workout. Um, I'll call that a workout. <laughs> so, so do you, uh, do you do cigars with whiskey? Have you, have you, I mean, obviously you've done that. I, I tried or it, it. more coffee? Uh, coffee i okay. i try and, I, and, and sometimes cream soda or ginger ale yeah. um i just i tried it once or twice and yeah it just kind of like see when i'm sipping whiskey you know i'm just sipping it casually which maybe that's what i need to be doing uh, when i'm having cigars but i i, I found that like I'm, I'm look i'm focusing on pairing the notes of the cigar to the whiskey and it kind of it overwhelms me a little bit and it's like with uh, a soda I'm not really thinking about the soda. I'm thinking about how the soda is changing the flavor of the cigar. Mm -hmm. Or with coffee, I'm thinking about how the coffee is changing the flavor of the cigar. When I'm doing with the whiskey, I find myself going, is the whiskey changing flavor? Is the cigar changing flavor? How are these pairing together? And it's like, maybe I'll get there, but uh, it hasn't been enjoyable. I mean, it hasn't been as enjoyable you know, having whiskey and cigars as it has been with coffee okay. and uh, you know sodas. And maybe I'll get there one day. Um, I'm not giving up. I just, yeah. Um, you know, absolutely. Well, David, man, we really appreciate yeah, you coming on sure. today and having the conversation with us. I, I've had a blast. Enjoyed this it. It's been a Same. treat to have you on. So yeah. Uh, for everybody listening, definitely go back out to uh, rarebird101.com. Check out the blog. All kinds of great information there. And again, if you haven't picked up the book American Spirit Wild Turkey Bourbon. Uh, from Rippy to Russell, it is an absolutely great read. And if you think the history is a uh, Started with Jimmy, which a lot of us did. It really didn't. There's a whole lot more before him, and it's a great read, great information for us thank whiskey you. nuts. So, David, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks, David. Thank you, and uh, you know, I, I look forward to uh, hearing this episode when it airs and sharing it uh, on social media, and you know, with my uh, uh, supporters. I, I'm looking forward to it. Well, we appreciate that. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening to this episode of Food, Wine, and Whiskey in Your Own Backyard. And until our next episode, enjoy your next pour.